Greetings, shareholders. Over the years, I have read a lot of blogs and watched a lot of video essays talking about all sorts of film tropes you might see. However, there's something that I feel like people have been neglecting, and it's to the point where I feel like I'm kind of going crazy because I seem like I'm the only one who's ever noticed it before. That is boardroom scenes. Yes, boardroom scenes. Hollywood loves to place them in their superhero movies. It's almost as if the lesson they learned from the success of Batman 89 was, hey, kids love long scenes of men in suits having discussions in boardrooms just like we do. Throughout the 90s, I observed this oddly specific trope all the way up until the present. And since no one has the guts to discuss it, I have to be the hero the internet needs. Now, with that said, I think it's important to define what makes a boardroom scene. And a boardroom scene is essentially where a villain gathers his underlings in a boardroom or boardroom-like area, discuss his plans, one of the underlings will disagree with that plan, and that villain will kill the underling, either in that exact scene or in the next connecting scene. Okay? So, with that established, let's go. Number 10, Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy came out in 1990, the very next summer after Tim Burton's Batman. Boy, does it show. Al Pacino plays big boy Caprice. He holds a meeting among his fellow mobsters, including James Caan's uh, Spaldoni, in order to figure out what to do about uh, Dick Tracy. And Spaldoni isn't having it. He says he wants no part uh, of his plan and leaves. Well, that went well. We'll just simply watch Spadoni leave the Mafia meeting and getting to his car and start it up with no problem. Oh my god! Being the first comic book film after Tim Burton's uh, Batman 89, it set the standard over what tropes the studios and fans will be uh, picking up on from it. Uh, Dick Tracy also shares a few things in common with uh, the Godfather films. Both films feature Al Pacino as a mobster. Both films feature James Caan getting killed in a car. Both films are great. Okay, okay, it has two things in common. Number nine, Captain America, the first Avenger. Okay, you thought your bosses were jerks and were always on your case. Red Skull's bosses are actual Nazis, but uh, what they didn't realize, the Red Skull is kind of like a double Nazi. Okay, for those of you who don't know your history, uh, the Nazis way overestimated their ability to take over the world. Halfway through, they were literally bleeding resources and could not handle funding Red Skull's big Hydra project. And so, kids, that's how World War II ended. A crazy man with a red skull face bankrupted the German government by building a separate military armed with lasers, uh, this leading Hitler to be gunned down in a movie theater by the Inglorious Bastards. Number eight is The Crow, which is based on the original graphic novel from James O. Barr, based on his own real-life tragedies of anger, sorrow, and revenge, which when a film is made, also included its own real-life tragedy of the loss of Brandon Lee. In that film, Top Dollar gathers his lieutenants in order to plan Devil's Night in his evil, spooky, gothic boardroom. Uh, this is all interrupted when Eric Draven enters and politely asks if uh, Top Dollar wouldn't mind handing over one of his evil henchmen, the ever-charming Skank. When Top Dollar answers this request with a hail of gunfire, Eric returns in kind, killing his entire crew, including Skank. <sighs> Goodbye, Skank. I'll always remember you. You know, when I see a used needle in an alleyway, that kind of thing. <sighs> this scene is an explosion of gunfire and violence chaos to a rocking My Life with the Thrill Kill cult song 
However, one element is missing from this scene, and that is the fact that Top Dollar doesn't kill any of his employees for disagreeing with him. In fact, Top Dollar is being a good boss by refusing to hand over one of his people to Eric. Now, it still makes the list if you combine this with a previous boardroom scene in this movie where he kills one of his employees from mouthing off to him, so it just does barely make the list. Number seven is Fantastic Four. Unpopular opinion, Tim Story's Fantastic Four movies are uh, okay. They, uh, they're not the worst, uh, but they don't try any harder than they have to. They're the least you can do. Matter of fact, there is no further evidence than its boardroom scene. Victor Von Doom uh, calls together his uh, shareholders in order to make a proposal. One of them decides to opt out. In the very next scene, Doom meets him in a very lonely place parking garage and kills him. Zap. Done. Over. Boom. And that's it. This scene explains very straightforward what a boardroom scene is much better than I could. You'd think if Doom was so smart, he would have managed to find some way in order to negotiate, convince, blackmail this one shareholder in order to go with him. But that wouldn't be evil enough. After all, his name is Victor Von Doom, not Victor Von Negotiates a Lot. Number six, Ant-Man. Uh, let's see. Darren Cross, uh, a.k.a. Fake Lex Luthor, uh, played by uh, Corey Stoll, has a big proposal uh, using technology very similar to the Pym Particles. A businessman uh, makes the fatal mistake of not wanting to support him, uh, only for the next scene uh, for him to find this businessman in the uh, men's room using the unfinished shrink ray on him. Horrifyingly, it doesn't shrink the businessman down. It reduces him to that thing we all come close to being, a bit of splooge in a tissue. This scene is a disturbing one, and it actually makes Cross a threat in an otherwise cute, fun film. The only drawback this has is there's no actual table in the room that they meet. They actually walk around, so it's only a boardroom scene in spirit. Number five is Wonder Woman. This is our most recent film, when Ludendorff and Dr. Poison present their evil new gas weapon to their superiors, they quickly say no. They're like, hey man, are you crazy? We're World War I Germans, not World War II Germans. Instead of just taking the L and moving on, our devilish duo use the gas on them and go on with their evil plans. Uh, it's a great scene that establishes the fact that Ludendorff and Dr. Poison do not care and will not be stopped by the normal wheels of government and will keep on killing until they win. What puts this at the halfway point is the same reason for Ant-Man. Unfortunately, no official boardroom or table, but other than that, it does meet the requirements. Now, number four is Spider-Man. Oh yeah, now we're getting into good stuff. Willem Dafoe's Norman Osborn, founder of Oscorp, is having a pretty good day. He's gained superpowers from his goblin formula, and he's literally blown the competition out of the sky, namely Quest Aerospace, while they were trying to do a test for the government. He's happy, and he uh, goes and reports to the board that uh, the costs are down, revenues are up, and their stocks have never been better. That's when the rug is pulled out from under him and the board says, well, actually, Quest Aerospace is trying to recover from their loss and in order to do that, they bought us out and we agreed with them. And part of the deal is you quit. So they essentially stabbed him in the back. And we're going to make this announcement tomorrow at the Macy Gray concert. Now, look, I don't want to tell you how to do your thing, but... Um, he 
doesn't take it very well. I mean, come on, he's Willem Dafoe playing Norman Osborn. Of course he doesn't take it well. He goes right to that concert and kills them all with one single grenade that apparently has the power of 12 atomic bombs. But, you know, to be fair, you can't say he didn't warn them when he yelled, Do you know how much I've sacrificed? If he had yelled that at me, I'd go, oh, okay, forget the deal. I, don't kill me. Look, do what Robert Pattinson did in The Lighthouse. When he goes all Willem Dafoe on you, just do what he wants. Number three is Batman 89. Now this is ground zero for this trope. Jack Napier was betrayed by his boss, Carl Grissom. However, becoming the Joker has been rather illuminating for him. He kills Grissom and takes over. His first move is to hold a meeting with the other leading crime bosses with a plan. The give me your businesses and I'll take care of them plan. Well, of course, somebody doesn't think that's a good idea and asks the simple question, what if I say no? The Joker very casually walks over to him and not only murders him comically, but horrifically with a joy buzzer that it just ignites his entire body within seconds, although it leaves his suit very nice. He ends up looking like a Indiana Jones prop. So uh, keep in mind, this guy just asked what would happen if he said no. Joker is the type of guy that will make an example out of someone for the rest of the group. This is why he has that same sparkling, diehard loyalty from his followers that caused them to go off and bang plant ladies. Number two, The Dark Knight. Yes, 2008's Batman film reverses the situation on the boardroom situation, but still has Joker owning the room. You see, as Batman has like been taking down Falcone and the other crime bosses, the remaining crime bosses decide to get together and have a panic room situation to discuss the Batman problem. That's when this dirty ass clown shows up with this outrageous plan. I'm going to kill Batman, this guy you can't touch, for half of all your money. Now, admittedly, that does sound a little extreme to the point where one of the crime bosses, Gamble, asks his henchman to usher him out of the room, prompting Joker to kill him instantly with the disappearing pencil trick. Now, to say that this action sucks the air out of the room would be quite an understatement. Uh, Joker makes his offer and bolts. Gamble isn't uh, quite uh, forgiving, uh, so he remains in the way. Joker isn't dumb, frankly, so he sets up a trap for the crime boss who walks right into it. Therefore, killing the one crime boss that might have stopped his elaborate plan. Once again, Joker proves that he is the MVP of this list and this trope. Uh, important lesson, if Joker has something to say, uh, just say yes. Number one. And now we've arrived to the number one boardroom scene in superhero film history, and it is Avengers. <laughs> no, wait, not that Avengers. I'm talking about the British Avengers film from 1998. Okay, quick backstory for those who only know Marvel and DC. ITV's Networks Avengers spy series debuted in the 1960s, 1961, and it aired in a America on ABC. It was a super spy show that focused on two British secret agents that investigated the uh, deaths of their fallen comrades. And it had a sci-fi edge to it. It had really witty, clever stories backed up by tongue-in-cheek dialogue. It's really good. If you can check it out, check it out. It's extremely 60s in the best possible way. All right, now, flash forward to the 90s. And imagine my excitement when it was announced that there was a big budget film in the works and it was starring Ray Fiennes as Steve, yay! Uma Thurman as Mrs. Peel, yes, awesome! Sean Connery as the villain, Sir August D. Winter, wow! And it would be directed by Jeremiah Chekchik? Let's 
let's see. Uh, director of National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and Benny and June, which I'm sure are widely known for their action sequences. Oh, oh okay, okay. Big rich guy, Augusty Winter, played by Sean Connery, he has this weather machine that he's going to use to take over the planet, and he has assembled all of his minions. These people are the most powerful, rich, evil figures in all of the world, and they are coming to one last meeting. And just before he makes his final move, he gives them the chance to opt out, two of which do, and he immediately murders them with throwing daggers. Now, you think maybe it might have been a good idea to... You'll know, mention that in the exit plan of his company, but hey, it, whatever, whatever, he's evil. He's a bad guy. Okay, now this is a pretty cut and dry boardroom scene, so why is it number one? Well, you see, because these men are the most powerful and important all over the world, he had them protect their identities with disguises. And this is what they look like. They went for a gummy bear look. Look at them! Okay, sure. <sighs> Let me get this straight. To cover up the fact that he's having the world's most evil, influential men, figures, powerful all over the world, meeting at this one place, he has them come under the cover of a furry convention? Now, uh, keep in mind, this is the late 90s, so it's most likely like Putin and the Koch brothers are there and they're wearing those suits. Oh, boy. Well, the scene is ruined, of course, for him when uh, Steve and Mrs. Peel show up. How did you know it was me? It was obvious. If this was truly a bunch of furries, then where would the openings be in their crotches? Damn! I'm ruined! Well, to make my escape, I must meet with Peter Jackson in order to turn down the role of Gandalf. In that garbage fire of a film I'm sure he's making. All right, so that's our list. Uh, that was my choices of the top ten uh, boardroom scenes in all of comic book films. I'm sure you have your own choices, so you can let me know in the comments below. You can also uh, follow me on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can support this channel at a dollar a month over on Patreon. You can also uh, purchase Red Knight and DaVita. Uh, at uh, Manos Publishing. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, which is the actual subscribe button. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about this kind of stuff. Until then, I think the meeting is adjourned. Push the button, Lindsay. <laughs>